Hey everyone, and welcome to the City UX podcast. And today I have a very special guest with me. One is Dr. Brett Petzer, who I did my PhD with. And uh, the other one, a very special guest, Mr. Sebastian Messerschmidt. Messerschmidt, that's right. Messerschmidt. That's a hard one, like the famous. The, <laughs> and no, but different. <laughs> from the Dutch Consul General in Vancouver. That's right. And uh, today we are at the BC uh, Cycling Coalition Active Transportation Summit. We want to talk about why this is so important, is this connect, making the connection between government, between research institutes, and between uh, private enterprises, and why that's key to make cycling work and to advance the active transportation agenda. So I want to start with you, Brett. And uh, you've been here for only less than 48 hours, I believe, at this point, in North America. Yes. What are your first impressions of this continent? Um, I'd say coming to and from the conference, uh, being impressed by the SkyTrain. I've been impressed by the fact that it was a radical vision in its time, which is now being extended because it, in retrospect, it looks obvious that the city needed that. Uh, it never is obvious at the time. It's always upsets everybody, will be more expensive than planned. And you look back and it's enabled decades of growth. Uh, here, this conference is a bit the same. Um, these people are also they know that their message is true, that if you could, that this country and province and city has a perfect cycling network, it's just that cars are on it. Um, yeah. And that the, the, there's half of the message here that, that everybody's happy with is adding on cycling infrastructure to the network of sidewalks and the, the streets for cars. The second half is taking some things away from motorists, not their ability to drive, not their ability to reach places by car, but perhaps their ability to do everything in the most direct way or to do, you know, the, the just not fundamental rights, but some privileges. Um, and that, I think, is the tense part of this conference. But it's it's extraordinary. It's positive. Everybody knows their, their, everybody knows their story and their work well. And I feel like what's happening in this room and these two days is very powerful. I do wonder, the last one was five years ago. Right. So this is a big bang. And there needs to be a big bang next month and the month after that for years and years and years, this level. Right. Uh, because what's happening here is magical. But the whole province is not going to reach its sustainability targets and its targets for safety for the future, a good future, on the back of these people, unless the whole system is pointing the same way. So that was a very long, hello. Yeah. I'm sorry. No, it's, a good, it's a good answer. And, uh, I like that. Sebastian, you've been here for around two, two years. years two right? years, yeah. Uh, and in those two years, uh, as a Dutchman, yeah. um, <laughs> in those two years, how have you come to see cycling in Vancouver and I think North America in general, we can say that, versus yeah. you know, yeah. where you grew up. Well, um, so I arrived in Vancouver and as soon as my stuff arrived, it was always a bit later, I got my bicycle out and I wanted to ride to work as soon as I could. One thing that struck me, of course, is that Vancouver is hilly, so it's not like the Netherlands, it's quite hilly. Lived in Cape Town before this, was also hilly, so I immediately felt, oh yeah, hmm, I gotta stay in shape. Hmm. Unless you have an e-bike, then you're fine. I do not own an e-bike, so I've got to stay in shape. Um, but then also, what I also found, I didn't plan my route. And that was a mistake. Because I went straight line to my office, and it was over Granville Bridge, which they are um, reconstructing now. But back then, it was a dangerous bridge. And there was no sign telling me I shouldn't go on that bridge. So I just went. It's cars rushing by, trucks rushing by, all very fast. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I take the sidewalks, people walking there, no. Should I stay on the road with all these cars? No, it just felt dangerous, scary, horrifying. So that was a bad experience. Um, but so that got me down a little bit, like, can I, not, can I not cycle here? So I asked my colleagues and they said, oh, did you take Granville Bridge? <laughs> so they said, so I pulled out Google Maps, uh, which is reasonably okay, not, not perfect for cycling, but you, you get a sense. And actually I saw like, oh, wait a minute, if I just take some detours, it's actually probably going to be safer. Mm -hmm. So on that experience, I'm trying to kind of find out what the best route is. And I have a really good route now. There is a network out there in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. 
it just isn't perfect, which is fine, but there is one, mm. which I think, if you look at the car centricity of life in North America, is amazing. Yeah. So Vancouver has done something really well. It's mm. actually there. Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to plan your way, which is mm. fine. As you know, there's some signs where you shouldn't go as a bicycle that would help. But in essence, there is, there is a structure which you can use as a cyclist. So that was, that was a bit of an optimistic note afterwards. Um, translating that to what's happening today and yesterday, I'm very optimistic. Uh, but I'm optimistic for the long haul, not for tomorrow. I'm optimistic for the days after. Mm -hmm. um, what you see in this room, in the, like in the big main hall when we start, and you look around like who's there, you'll find lots of people from the Ministry of Transportation of mm -hmm. British Columbia which is amazing. Mm. The policymakers are actually there. Minister on the first day. The minister on the first day comes to deliver a keynote speech, no. which is a political signal like, mm. we find what you're doing interesting. Mm. We want to know more. Mm. Then there's, of course, the activist lobbyists, which you, you know, they organize this thing. Mm. I get it. They should be there. But then there's also First Nations. Mm. You can't do anything infrastructure in Canada without the First Nations, especially in BC where it's unceded territories. Mm. You have to involve them from the first and you should involve them from the first because they are the owners of the land. So mm. they, you should really, and that's something for European companies and European organizations to really uh, to bring home. It's important mm. to start there. They're in the room. Then um, researchers are in the room, academia in the room, like mm. yourselves which is important, urban planners, mm. urban developers, infrastructure planners, they're in the room, and there's private sector in the room. And then you have what we call in the Netherlands, either the diamond, for because you have the civil society involved, mm. or the triple helix, if you have government, private sector, and, and business. Mm. And any innovation which is big and impactful in society needs those groups. Mm. I would say four in, there's four in, in Canada. Yeah. So to have them in the, rule, in the room, not only in the room, but not confronting each other, but having this enthusiastic talk mm. of how can we build a vision for the future, that's great. At the same time, there's a realistic sense like, hey, we, we are talking this now, we need to walk it still, mm. and we still have to put, the, put our money where our mouth is. Mm. And there's a, there, so it's also realistic. It's not a dream-like conference where people are dreaming big things which are unrealistic. There's actually a sense of, this is where we want to go. Let's see what steps we need to take, mm. which I think that this is amazing. And this for after five years of no conference yeah. and pulling this off by Move Me, the, the organization Move Me and BC Cycling Coalition, it's an amazing thing. And the dynamic, dynamics is good. We tried to get involved about 10 years ago. The traction wasn't there. So mm. we kind of stepped out again. Mm. Attraction is there today. So we see room for innovation. We see room for uh, 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 like it, like the, the, the intergovernmental, the interbusiness, mm -hmm. like the triple helix is connecting mm -hmm. to each other yeah. to get that connection is really strong. So I think I'm positive about what we can do in the future, but we got to be patient too, because there is like infrastructure development. You know better than I do. Our long-term processes, which need which which need a lot of parties involved to to want to turn the same mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be resistance. Yeah. Um, like you said about the SkyTrain, the same in the Netherlands, mm. people screaming their lungs out when Amsterdam mm. was going from a car infested city to the city it's, it's now, especially businesses were scared they were going to lose money being yeah. kind of park the car in front of their business. Yeah. Turns out research shows the opposite. You, you make it a, a really nice area to walk and bike instead of drive and make sure that people can park the car somewhere else and have tra public transport coming in or something else coming in very easily and cheap then everybody's happy and revenues go up mm. instead of down. Yeah. So I'm excited. I'm excited. There's a good vibe. Good mm. vibes. Good mm. vibe in Western Canada. I, I find that interesting too because uh, you deal with all sorts of different industry. Now, now, Brett, you and me, we're in the transportation sector. We're like mm. urban planning, transport, a narrow group of people, mm. right? We just mm. characterize mm. that. Mm. Um, Sebastian, you deal with all industries and your job is different from ours, which yeah. is con uh, transportation. Yours is making an uh, international connection. That's right. So given your, your broad expertise and yeah. contacts, yeah. would you say that there's something you know, special about this cycling group that's, uh, uh, that has a, a special spirit about it, that yeah. um, you know, there's a bit more activism involved and there's a bit more, I guess, personal stories that are brought in? Whereas, there's a community. There's a community, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. You sense it. And as a Dutch person, 
who gets born with bicycles to your feet, mm. you walk into the room here and you feel like, ah, mm. this is it. my community. Yeah. This is my group. I, I get these people. They have yeah. a similar kind of vibe. Although I must say, um, in the Netherlands, we're not so activist about cycling because it's part of our lives. Mm. We don't call ourselves cyclists. Mm. You just, when you go get your hair cut, when I used to have hair, you go on the bicycle. Mm. When you go grocery store, you go on a yeah. bicycle. When you it go was, to the library, you go on a bicycle. You it go was to school. designed in. Yeah, it's part uh, of our lives. Yeah. Here, it's still, people are still, the people on mm. the bicycles are still a bit more front runners, mm. uh, the pioneers. The, so there's that sense, which makes it slightly different. Brett, what was your first experience like from South Africa to the Netherlands and being mm. in a society that has adopted you know, mass cycling? Was, mm. was that eye-opening for you? Well, it was a very profound uh, liberation. Mm -hmm. um, it was a feeling that with my, my body and one really humble machine, I could go anywhere that I wanted with a bottle of water and a sandwich. And I could also walk anywhere. You know, it's not a country of fences. It's a country of uh, wayfinding and signposts rather than uh, signs that say keep out, not here, children only with an adult, dogs only on a leash, only with permission, only on Sundays, not in winter. It's a country of, by default, it's a country that allows itself, it opens itself up to a single person who doesn't have to be rich, doesn't have to have an, a, an expensive co machine, a car, can have a cheap machine, a bicycle, or just walk. And that is a very deep difference. It's a very deep difference in what, how people think of a good childhood. Mm -hmm. What's a good childhood is a child that has a habitat and where the child is out of sight of their parents as soon as it can walk. Um, that's a deep difference and the world was more like that. And in, even in places like this, that's only one or two generations back. It's in living memory. Older people remember that. It's just that younger children have been, been taken from them, but ideas, we have enough ideas in this building right now for all of the solutions. Um, of course, it's gonna be in competition with all the other needs in society, the other yeah. ministries that you have that overview of. Yeah. Um, and that's important. So there's a lot of politics involved in that. But at Mobicon, we've been working in Canada for a long time we see small towns often leading the way. Yeah. Canmore is the, a good example of a town that just achieved Dutch solutions in a place where it supposedly is impossible to the point of getting it built and installed, you know, concrete poured. It's there, it's done, you can go see it. Um, so there are political victories possible in the system even right now. Um, and that's what's exciting about this conference is that the minister is here yeah. and he's announcing good things. People want even more. The ambition is even higher. Yeah. And I think people are putting some good positive pressure on the city, on the ministry to always say, um, you have given us some good news, but how is the province gonna reach its own targets that you have politically declared? Show us year by year how you're going to get there and not magically that everything happens in year 14 of the 15 year vision. Uh, so I think what's different between this conference and this conference happening in the 1970s mm. is that the same people here were activists, they care, there's a mix of academia researchers. The difference is in the 70s we had time. Yeah. We don't have time now. These things, these people have to win. Uh, society actually needs them to. Yeah. Um, that is a big difference. So that's why I'm optimistic about towns like we had Powell River in our, our fireside chat. Small town, big ambition, want to connect to other towns with non-car infrastructure, and they want children to have a good life, a free life. Yeah. Those children will grow up differently from children who can never go somewhere unless an adult takes them. They're always being watched. They can never interact freely. You know, you know it's... That's the ambition that's deeper than streets, roads, networks, cars, modal filters. It's deeper. Um, 
and, and people who don't care about cycling will care about that. It's something that touch, it touches everyone in society. So, uh, yeah, infrastructure is important. We have to have it. It's hard to get, it's expensive, but underneath it is a bigger vision. And I think that's what's truly exciting about being here. Well said, Brett. In a moment, we're going to talk about uh, policy transfer and how to export knowledge between uh, Dutch cycling to other small towns, as you brought up. But first, I wanted to direct your attention to the comments or the description of this video, where we have the link to the full talk where Brett and I and Anastasia uh, talked about the Netherlands and Powell River. So that's right down the comments below. How do you export that knowledge? What, because the Netherlands is so advanced and it's almost a different world over there, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's, it's very hard for North American cities to relate, uh, to go from 1%, maybe 2% bike share to something like 27%. Like, how do you relate to a place that has 10x the amount of cycling that you currently have right now? So do either of you have any thoughts on how to make that bridge? Yes, Sebastian. Well, the, the minister said it yesterday too. It's also in, in his mind, I'm not blaming him for it, that people say this is, this is not Amsterdam. Mm. Uh, but if you look at the picture of Amsterdam 1970, it was car infested. We're not so different here in North America than we are in Europe. Mm. Paris has shown it. I mean, if Paris can do it, Paris, that was like the cars everywhere. If they can do it, if London can make big adjustments, if Barcelona can make this big adjustments, mm. then why not Vancouver, Seattle, uh, you know? It's, 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 it's not a miracle. You, can just, you just have to make, have the political will and then see where it goes. If you have the, the people at the table of the different uh, people that you need, the communities, the academia, the mm. private sector, you can make it happen. And these cities show, it's not just the Netherlands, it's also elsewhere in Europe mm. where they show it. Yeah. It's, it's possible. It's not weird. <laughs> All right, then let's tackle the element of time. Uh, we bring up 1970s. You mentioned that in the 1970s there was an abundance of time. Do we still have that abundance of time to uh, make these changes nowadays? Keeping in mind, you know, the oil crisis was in the 70s and things perhaps then felt just as urgent as things feel today, right? Um, wh what, what advice would you give for cities you know, as a consultant academic, for those who want to shrink the time horizon, for those who say, we have no time? Well, this is a crisis we must not waste. The Dutch didn't waste the crisis in the 70s. Um, I think what we were in a PhD unit with historians like Henk Jan Decker who wrote mm the history of a century of Dutch policy. And he also showed that there, um, there were, everything was radical and upsetting when it was introduced. There were moments when radical visions for special reasons survived. Mm -hmm. um, we are in a similar crisis, although this one I think is quite different because um, it's not human, co it's human caused, but we also can't uncause it quickly. Yeah. It's in motion. <laughs> Even if we stopped emitting any carbon tomorrow, it's not the oil crisis that truly was truly under human control at that time. Yeah. Um, so with that said, um, I think that what's incredibly exciting is that uh, young people almost horizontally in organizations, the ministry, in city councils, people maybe everybody younger than me, I guess, or, you know, uh, <laughs> has quite a big, diff a quite a different outlook. And that's a, a vast rising political resource. Yeah. It's in town councils, it's in local neighborhoods, it's in uh, you know, the, the immense power that the, the, the English speaking world gives to individuals to have a say in what, once they've moved into community, they have a big say in what happens next. And maybe that's not always, I, sometimes that makes it quite hard for cycling infrastructure but if young people everywhere and older people who, 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 who see what the timeline is for the future, they want, again, like a better childhood for their grandchildren. They want what they had. 
running free, you know? But that, that I want to big. jump in though, because mm -hmm. like, it, it, like you pointed out before also, it's not just about cycling infrastructure, right? It's, uh, we have TransLink here today who's, who, who developed the SkyTrain mm -hmm. and who are talking now about intermodality. Like how can we make sure that pedestrians and bicycle riders can come to our stations so we have more people riding them? Mm -hmm. Like research shows in the Netherlands, if you do that, like more, more, like 10% yeah. more yeah. go up. Um, and it's also like, it, it should be a process, I think, if you want to be successful, it should be very inclusive. Mm -hmm. So you want to also involve the people that are in cars. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Because in, in, the, in the car world, there's people going from the diesel engine to electric, mm -hmm. which, mm -hmm in some sense is a step forward. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little bit worried what we're going to do with all the lithium batteries, but it's, it's a step forward. Yeah. Um, so we have to honor all these step forwards and kind of see how we make sure that mm -hmm. everybody keeps the room to improve to get to that zero emissions future. Um, so it's and, and also with, then that's where the activism, like you have this, this delicate balance mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. want to have people battling for a good cause, mm. but at the same time, not polarizing so much mm. that it becomes a political thing only. Yeah. Because if it becomes a political thing only, then it will swing left, right, center mm. all the time with a new election. Yeah. What you really want is society to roll towards that more sustainable future, Fair which enough. means you have to involve people. Yeah, maybe you have some to have to shake the tree and see what apples come out and mm -hmm. they do some stuff that not everybody likes, but at other times you have to make sure that you yeah. keep everybody on board and not estrange everybody from the process. Can I build on that? Briefly. I love yeah, briefly. Old, yes. Um, I think that's so important to say, no one here in this conference has spoken of the car as the enemy. Exactly. And that's, uh, that's very yeah. important. I mentioned in our fireside chat that I think enforced car dependency is an enemy. It's something that nobody wants. It's something that drivers don't want yeah. because it means that they can't get anywhere in the Netherlands, driving is a great pleasure. It's a country full of cars. It's just that they operate in a quite different physical world from the dense city centers where walking and cycling dominate. But you can drive. You just can't drive fast. You just can't always drive directly. But you can drive. And then the country accommodates a large number of cars. It's a, but those streets are a pleasure to drive on because everybody there really needs to drive. It's not just that they all had absolutely no other choice, mm. you know. Uh, so driving, that's transformative for drivers. Um, and that's an important part of the, that, that also is liber emancipation yeah. of people. Parents don't have to spend their lives driving their children around. Parents don't want that and kids don't want exactly. that. Let them, <laughs> let them have their lives, exactly. you know. Do their own thing. Yeah. <laughs> all right. One last question to wrap this up. Uh, I've come across this concept recently from a chemistry. It's the, con the idea of a catalyst, right? A catalyst uh, in, in chemical terms is uh, something that accelerates chemical reactions between two different chemicals, right? And I, I like this term because uh, in cycling and transportation and mind shift, moving from one type of dominant modality to another, we also need some type of catalyst to really accelerate the shift. So I want you to think about a catalyst that you think is most important in today's world. And uh, based on what you've seen here today, what do you think that catalyst is for moving forward today for cycling? It's a tough one. I've got five things. Oh, oh no. no. Okay, wow, all right. I learned, <laughs> I learned today at this conference that uh, wheeled pedestrians, so wheelchair users, mobility scooters, yeah. mm -hmm. they are not allowed to use cycling infrastructure, I think, formally. Yeah. That needs to change. Uh, those two groups of people are powerful allies in the Netherlands. They don't agree on everything but they, get, they win their fight, more of their fights because they work together. Yeah. Cycling infrastructure has to be designed for wheeled pedestrians, not just bicycles. Uh, second thing, um, e-bike rebates. Anywhere that there's state help for uh, electrifying cars, that same money would go 50 to 60, sometimes 100 times further if it was given directed to e-bikes. Um, and with that comes 
the minister announced this, funding for cycling that isn't always tied to road programs. Let us build cycling infrastructure from the logic of a cycling network, not when we repair roads, we do something on the side. That doesn't automatically make a system. That just makes an archipelago of things that are not connected. And lastly, there's excellent work being done here on two things, getting, bringing cycling to older people and bringing cycling to young children. Yeah. So just massively expand that. And all of that requires maybe some limits on driving. Allow it, make things, you can drive everywhere. You don't always have to drive by the straightest possible route and not at the speed that feels comfortable to you, but at the speed that is fair to people outside the car. Cars also, oh, also taxation according to weight. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's done. That's done. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Uh, for, for, for me, like you're, you're asking about catalysts of change, and not all of the time, but usually it's bottom up. It's society that's demanding change. So what's happening here today is that kind of start. If that spark gets wider, if those communities, if the people that go back into their organizations and back into their communities, and back into their families, and if this spreads, that's when you get the real change because that will wake up politicians. Politicians see that their electorate wants something, so they're going to make different decisions, and that in the end will also make uh, make an, uh, an impact on the budget division, which means that all the engineers can suddenly get other kinds of projects that they want to do because there's budget available for for a new area called active transporta uh, transportation. So, the the, the the making sure that um, that the benefits of active transportation are are physically experienced by people is, I think, the most important thing. That will spark off what you need. So also when you have a minister elected, or you have a mayor, or you have a councillor, or you have a school teacher, or you have a doctor, making sure those people understand mm. that if you ride a bicycle to work or to the grocery store, that that's a fun experience if the enabling factors are there. That will just spark the change, I think from the people's perspective. So one comment I do have, maybe looking forward, we Dutch are very good at design thinking. Design thinking is that, that decision model where you bring in the community and the users and then add on all the others, the engineers, the policy makers. Mm. And it's a model of decision making where you get to a project that has the support that you need. Mm. I think that's what we need at this moment because you ha now have found a community here that's willing to go with this. Yeah. So the triple helix or the diamond is there. Mm. The next step is getting the design thinking going. Mm. Like if you create something new, let's get everybody around the table. Mm. And I think that we Dutch have a real beautiful model of design thinking in that. And that's something I want to research, whether we can have that connect to this ecosystem here. Mm. We need 10 more of you, George. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and on that note, uh, Sebastian, Brett, thank you very much for doing this with me. Thank you for being here. Like yeah. you both embody what I was talking about when with the ecosystems connecting, because you're both researchers and private sector and developers. So there you go. Yay you, us. You embody it. Yay you. Yeah, thanks for bringing it. <laughs> Yay you. <laughs> And to the audience, if you want to hear more, especially about small towns and applying Dutch knowledge, uh, Brett and I did a fireside chat at the BC uh, Active Transportation Summit here in 2024. Uh, click, <laughs> click down below for that link, and thanks for listening.